Good morning. The mercies of the Lord are new every morning. That is the promise that we read all through our sacred scriptures, Genesis to Revelation. You cannot miss it. And I must say, you also cannot miss that reality whenever we gather together here at the chapel in worship. We have so many of our members on the road traveling or back home up north this month. But for those of you who realize this is the best place to be in June, <laughs> uh, Sunday morning is the place to be to encourage one another and to recharge our spiritual batteries uh, in the knowledge that God is good, God's faithfulness is everlasting and is never ending. There is a great deal going on, even as the summer kind of weighs down upon us with its heat and humidity. Uh, if you are new to the chapel, you've chosen an extremely good Sunday to find out who we are. The flowers and a luscious reception await for all of you. Uh, this is Cheryl and Frank Miller's 50th wedding anniversary, and they wanted to share it with you all. Uh, Frank and Cheryl, where are you at this moment? They're, they're there with their grandchildren and with lays around the neck. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> and both of you play such essential roles here at the chapel. Thank you for including us as family in the celebration. Uh, I will see all of you. Fellowship Hall, end of the deck. And if this is your first exposure to the chapel, we mean you as well. Please join us, if only for a short time. The Men's Fellowship enjoys summertime, and they have two announcements they've asked me to share. They will meet this Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock at IHOP, the International House of Pancake. I won't ask why theologically that is significant to them, but we'll leave it there. And next Sunday, next Sunday is fun. Of course, it's Independence Day weekend for our nation. And next Sunday, the men will be hosting an ice cream social. And trust me, they do it well. <laughs> and so plan on spending a few extra moments next Sunday after worship and invite your friends and family. Other than that, we have a class on Wednesday. We have mission troops every other trip to Bethel every other Monday and every Tuesday. Details are in the bulletin. But for this moment in time, God has called us together because he loves us. And what parent does not want a child to work with other children to organize a party to say thank you, we love you in return? So let's take a moment to stand to welcome one another in Christ. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. 
Come before God with joyful songs. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord. Praise God. For the Lord is good, and God's love endures forever. God's faithfulness continues through all generations. Would you join me in prayer? Our gracious and loving God, we are always privileged, honored, and grateful for opportunities to link ourselves together in praise of you. We thank you for the beauty of creation and for new life in Christ Jesus, the way that grounds us and centers us and gives us the opportunity to both enjoy this life and trust you for life everlasting. In our worship, we seek to draw closer to you. And so speak to each one of us the words we need to hear. For we come in the strong name of our Savior, our Lord, our friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> We come before God, the holy and loving God. We come as imperfect people reaching up to him, but so many times falling short. So we need once again to be honest with God, confess our sins and receive his fresh forgiveness. Let us pray our prayer of confession. Almighty God, in the beauty of holiness, you created this world and pronounced it good. In love, you fashioned humanity in your own image and gave us work to do. Forgive us when we hold back from being the people you are calling us to be. Forgive us when we rush through life, too busy, too impatient to spend time with you or to serve those we you love. By the power of your Holy Spirit, draw us close and teach us the wisdom of walking with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Friends, hear and believe the good news. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thank you, Julian. And as we come to our time of prayers, again, one of the grand joys in our particular time in history is to see a couple who have been married 50 years and still love each other and want to celebrate. <laughs> and so we do not take these opportunities to join with them for granted. Uh, that, that truly is a gift of God and of grace. On the other side of the human experience, life is difficult. We are reminded of that every time we look at the news media, so often every time we pick up the telephone or share with another person. In addition to those who have asked to be included in your prayers in our bulletin, uh, we have that list week after week updated. We have a few additional to add. Member Jackie Willman will be having surgery tomorrow, and uh, this was moved up a few weeks for her, and she would very much appreciate your prayers. Um, we had very tragic news in our presbytery. Uh, our sister church, Covenant Fort Myers, one of their leading volunteers, marvelous woman many of us have worked with in many capacities on presbytery committees and mission trips. Joanne Leader was murdered. And uh, that is an extremely difficult path for those who now are grieving her loss as well. We also have a prayer request for Marg Towner's, uh, her sister and husband. My sister and husband are in the path of the new Goodwin Forest Fire. Uh, in Arizona, which fire right now is just five miles from their home and moving in their direction. And of course, there are thousands as well who are in such terrible situations. Um, and yes, this morning in the adult class, you missed a wonderful Sunday school class at nine, by the way, if you were not there. But this morning, uh, one of those joining us spoke of her nephew. His name is Seth Thomas. Uh, he has been in Peru as a medical missionary. He's a medical student and has gone missing for the last two days. And so please be in prayer for him, for the searchers, for the families, for the mission team. Um, again, this, this world is not easy. But the good news of the gospel is, with God, there are no surprises. And God promises wherever we find ourselves, whether it's looking in the face of a fire or a missing person, God is there and will walk us through. In that confidence, would you join me as we go to our Lord in prayer? <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you that in the midst of a world that can take our breath away with sadness and grief, you are there. We thank you that you did not hold back even your own son, but out of sheer love allowed him to enter this world of time and space of weakness, of betrayal and death, so that we might know deep within our souls that we are not alone and that you are a creator, a God, a redeemer who understands. We confess that often we are weak need when difficult times come our way. We often do not have the words to speak and comfort another. But we thank you that by the spirit of the living Christ, you promise to constantly be at work, strengthening us, grounding us, giving us the skills, the abilities, the opportunities we need to reflect your grace and hope, even within the worst that life may bring us. 
We pray this morning for all of those that we have already mentioned, for those who are grieving Joanne's death, for the one who did it. We pray for those in the fire's path and those who already are serving, suffering from the devastations, whether it's in the borders of our own nation or our friends in England. We pray for Jackie as she undergoes surgery and for the surgical medical team. We pray for Arnie, for Christine, for Margot, for David and Lisa, for Al, for Jean and Ida, for so many who week after week look to you for a relief from pain, for courage, for faith, for strength. We pray for ourselves as we walk into these more relaxed summer months, that we would use them as an opportunity to recreate, to re-energize and reconnect with you. Give us wisdom as we choose what to read and fill our minds with as we look out on one day after another and choose whether to see what's wrong in the world or whether to embrace and celebrate what's right. We pray, Lord, that you would use us as channels of your own grace wherever these summer days may find us. Hear us as we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord has given us so much, it is our privilege to return some of it to him in order that through its use, God can give more to others. Let us worship God now as we take up our tithes and offerings.
I can do my duty as a Christian ought. If I can bring back beauty to a world of rot. If I can spread love's message that the master taught, then my living have offered to you our gifts. Receive them, O Lord. Bless those who use them and those who are on the receiving end of those who use them. And to your name be the glory. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament message this morning is partially from the Proverbs and partially from the Psalms. Hear the word of God. It's wise to be patient and show what you are like by forgiving others. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but one who has a hasty temper exalts folly. 
A hot-tempered person stirs up strife, but the one who is slow to anger and patient calms disputes. Don't be a fool and quickly use your temper. Be sensible and patient. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for God. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Thank you, John. Well, as we come to our New Testament lesson, if you have been here the last three weeks, you know that that little photo on the front of the bulletin lays out our worship themes for the summer. We're spending time walking through Galatians 5's fruit of the Spirit, one fruit, the outer peer, peel, the appearance being love. And what we've been looking at as we walk through Paul's description of the flavors and characteristics within, uh, we've been looking at joy, peace, and today that word we all fear to ever pray for, patience. <clears throat> Paul, I suspect, by nature was not a patient person. If you know anything of his biography, early in life he was a zealot. He was crazed in his determination to wipe out the first 
followers of Jesus, the early church, and after his conversion, remarkably, miraculously, by an appearance of the risen Lord, after that he became just as passionate in proclaiming a gospel of grace and mercy and love. Uh, we are indebted to him. It could not have been easy for him to be, spend the last few years of his life imprisoned, but that's what happened. And what we are hearing today is one small part of a letter he wrote from prison to a cluster of churches, a cluster of believers in the city of Colossae, today's Turkey. Listen with me as we pick up again just a small piece of his impassioned plea to a people he loved. God loves you and has chosen you as his own special people. So be gentle, kind, humble, meek, and patient. Put up with each other and forgive anyone who does you wrong, just as Christ has forgiven you. Love is more important than anything else. Love is what ties everything completely together. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can't read those words without laughing at the idea of this holy, sacred apostle writing, hey, put up with each other, will ya? <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? Put up with each other? Uh, those are not words I would expect to hear from a spiritual, theological tome. But then again, we are followers of Jesus in a unique, strange moment in history when grown, otherwise civilized, intelligent adults in leadership positions, both sides of any aisle, feel perfectly comfortable bashing and critiquing and name-calling each other. I mean, this is a crazy time in which to live. And I find it strangely comforting to know that we're not the first. <laughs> that even in the church, it can be a struggle to love one another, to be patient with one another, to put up, <laughs> to put up with one we call sister, brother in our better days. <clears throat> I think back to when I was a little girl, I loved to be in my grandmother's kitchen. She was always baking, always cooking, phenomenal. And behind her stove, I can remember as a very young girl, working hard to memorize the words on a cast iron plaque behind her stove. And I suspect some of you may have seen the same cast iron plaque or you've seen the words. It went, to live above with saints we love, that will be grace and glory. To live below with saints we know, that's another story. <laughs> <coughs> I can remember nagging her, Grandma, what does that mean? <laughs> it made no sense to me. I find it comforting to say it again, that even in the first church, right out of the box, Jesus has walked with some of these people. They've sat under his teaching. They've been there when he miraculously healed. They were there to see him in the 40 days of his appearances after the resurrection, to see the nail prints in his hand, to hear that all of this was in fulfillment of ancient scripture, that it was all about love and grace and God's winsome invitation. And yet, 
over and over and over again, when we read the letters of Paul, when we read the Gospels, when we look at the other records from the period, we sense there was an awful lot of bickering going on. In fact, had we started our reading a little bit early in Colossians, verse 8 of the first chapter, <clears throat> we would have heard Paul speaking these words, which are even more shocking than, hey, put up with each other. He wrote, get rid of, literally, rid yourselves of anger, rage, malice, slander, and obscene, abusive, filthy, vulgar language. What? He's writing to the saints of God in the first church, the pure church in our imaginations. And yet already within their fellowship, there was this reputation for some folks feeling pretty comfortable speaking and treating each other just like they were expected to do out on the street or in business. It's not totally beyond understanding. Looking out at us today, we're pretty much a pretty homogeneous group. You know, we share far more in common than separates us. Thinking back to the very first days in Colossae, if we were there to look out on the worshipers, we would see a collection of individuals that would take our breath away. Within that congregation would have been people, good men and women, teenagers, children, who had been raised from the cradle to worship the gods of Greece and Rome. They were polytheist. Mom and dad were polytheist. Everybody is. Everybody understands this is how the world moves. Within the same collection of believers, there were Jews raised to believe in one God passionately, some very, very conservative members of the Pharisee party, some a little bit more reformed, progressive. But they're sitting now right next to a Gentile. The grandma would have said, don't you dare go under the same roof of a Gentile. Don't you dare eat their food. The worshiping community would have included, and this is frankly hard for me even to imagine, people who were enslaved by slave owners, perhaps sitting right next to them. It would have included Jewish women who were forbidden from learning scripture, next to Greek and Roman women who may have run their own businesses. It would have included, included a variety of ages, and in fact, if we look and parse out some of the writings of Paul, we know that they were there from a variety of nations, each with their own culture, each with their own preferred music style, each with their own preferred worship styles and expectations for food. Can you imagine the committee that pulls together a potluck for these folks? It takes our breath away. And what is the one thing that binds them together? Christ. And the invitation to come to God through what he has accomplished in his life, his death, his resurrection. And because of this, Paul says, you need to put every other loyalty in the back. You need to walk away from the way you were trained to look down on the lower classes and on the poor. You need to walk away from that nonsense. In Christ, there is no male or female. There is no slave or free. There is no rich or poor. We're all one. And folks, I hear him saying, it begins with not just tolerating each other, but with being patient with one another. Patience. Patient whatever circumstances come your way. Patient no matter what person decides to join the fellowship. Not all are equally easy to love <laughs> and adore. And patient, frankly, I would add patient with yourself. 
Because the reality is it's not easy to spend day in and day out or to work on a mission trip or to sit in a class or on a committee planning or even at a potluck or an ice cream social. It's not easy to be there with someone whose personality for one reason or another drives you crazy. <clears throat> and so the words of the apostle are very real. They are very relevant for us. Love, joy, peace, patience. So let's define term. Patience is a tough word to define. In fact, if we had time and took a little poll here, I think we'd probably come up with a number of bullets. What does it mean to be patient? One helpful definition is this. Patience is tolerance, compassion, understanding, and acceptance <clears throat> toward those we think are slower, thicker, and more irritating than ourselves. <laughs> I love it when I'm with an irritable person who lambasts somebody for being impatient. Yes, <laughs> that's me at times. Patience is misunderstood very, very often as passivity. Type A's tend to look at patient people and find themselves driven mad. Why aren't they working? Why aren't they doing something? But patience is not passive or inactive. Patience is waiting. Let me read this helpful quote from a psychologist, Dr. Judith Orloff. She says, patient doesn't mean passivity or resignation, but power. Patience is an emotionally freeing practice of waiting, watching, and knowing when to act. Ooh. I need to tack that on my bathroom mirror <laughs> for when I want to cram too many things in too little time. Patience with circumstance. <clears throat> That's where many of us find ourselves almost on a daily basis. And I, I need to say this right up front, I am so sensitive, I am so aware that for some of us, patience comes easier than others. My husband and I rediscover that every time we decide who's going to drive. <laughs> the experience at a red light is a whole different animal, depending on who's behind the wheel. But the Apostle Paul includes patience in his fruit of the Spirit. And so none of us has an excuse saying, well, that's just not my nature. I'm just not a na naturally patient person. That may very well be true, but that's no excuse. Because the fruit of the Spirit is already given. Followers of our Lord already have the fruit within, with all of its characteristic qualities. Our task is to choose whether to stifle its growth or to fertilize and work with it. How do we do that? One great piece of advice comes from phenomenal, brilliant violinist of the last century, Fritz Kreisler. He once had a woman after a concert come rushing up to him, gushing over. Hear the word she said to this incredible musician, I'd give my life to play as beautifully as you do. To which he answered, I did. How do you develop patience? You give your life to it. We give our life to it. We choose to be conscious of whether or not we are a patient people. Patient with circumstance, patient with other people, patient with ourselves. And the, the best portrayal, if you know me, you know I love movies, I love stories, I love narrative. 
The best depiction I have ever seen in literature comes out of that movie. If you haven't seen it recently, I watched it again just because I thought of it and it's like, oh, that was so sweet. Evan Almighty, where Morgan Freeman, whom I love, plays the God character. There's a moment in the movie where this wonderful, sweet young mother who's been praying for patience as her husband seems to be going crazy, believing that God has called him to build an ark. And in this scene, she's taken the kids and they're running away and she's lamenting the fact that she's been praying for patience and nobody's been listening. And so Morgan Freeman, the God character who's acting as if he's a waiter, kind of takes a seat next to her, seeing that she's very tearful. And here's what he says to her. These are words we can live on. He said, let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience? Or does God give them the opportunity to be patient? If he prayed for courage, does God give him courage? Or does God give him opportunities to be courageous? If someone prayed for the family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? Oh, yes. Most of us know better than to pray frontally for patience because we know the answer. Life will get out of control. <laughs> irritating, irritating people will come our way. Things will happen that will drive us mad, and we then have to choose how we will respond. The natural way or the way of the spirit? Let me give you one, one tip. If, if you are at all intrigued, if you're all open to building up your own patient capacity, this works. <clears throat> I try it periodically, although I'll confess it's been a while. The next time you go to the supermarket, and you can't pick a time when you've got all the time in the world, next time you go to the supermarket, choose the longest line. <laughs> I'm serious. And then let somebody go in front of you. <clears throat> and as you stand there, force yourself while you're wanting to spit nails at why the cashier is chatting with the person who's now taking out a stack full of coupons to go through what she did and did not buy. Instead of chewing nails, force yourself to pay attention to what's going on around you, to pray for the cashier, to notice the little child who's acting up next door, to Thank God for this opportunity to grow. It works. It works. If only helping us to laugh at ourselves the next time we lose it. <laughs> Things, circumstances, waiting, red lights, slow cashiers, service people that never do show, that can drive us nuts if we choose to allow it. Other people then come in view. Because, let's face it, our personalities to some degree are pretty much with us at birth. And by nature, some of us find it easier to get along with similar personality types to our own and find others a little less easy. How can we grow when it comes to being patient, not with circumstances, but with people? It begins, and you will never have success if you don't begin here. It begins with paying attention to what pushes our button. And as we become conscious to the pattern, to the predictable behavior that makes us nuts, translating that into prayer, saying, Lord, I can't believe she's whistling again. Help me to get over this. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
to translate the irritation into prayer. One man, I believe this is a true story, but I can't swear to it. One man named Edmund discovered, eh, not too hard of a way, how important it was to take one of his buttons that was always being pushed and turn it off. He was one of these people, there may be a few in the room, who when he is at work, especially if he is at his office and at his desk, he does not want to be interrupted and frequently would tell his secretarial pool, I do not want to be interrupted, I am busy, I am at work, this is a priority, shut the door. One day he's sitting at his desk, the door opens, a sheepish secretary pokes in her head and says, there's a call, I think you need to take it. He's already outraged, so he picks up the phone and he says, what is it? And he hears his wife on the other end of the line. She's now stuttering and stammering and clearly out of breath. And he barks again and says, would you get to the point? I'm trying to get some work done here. Which was all Julie needed to pull herself back find her voice and say to him in a very controlled way, I thought you would want to know that I have just discovered the airbags in our new BMW work just fine. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> he learned, he learned not to presume, to unplug that button he had given himself permission to keep charged. And I must say for Julie's end, she learned that it takes two to fight and you don't have to accept every invitation to a fight. You can back up, wait until you've got your voice, and hopefully with a bit of humor come back again and say and do what needs to be done. Of course, all of this, all of this is baby steps. Developing patience, growing patience, this, this is a lifetime of work, which is why it is so critical, so very critical, that we learn to be patient, not only with circumstance, not only with things out of our control, not only with other people, but patient with ourselves. I honestly see as one of the greatest tools of evil in this world, this lie that, you know, you've blown it so many times, it's too late. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. You just have a violent temper. You're just an impatient person, it's too late. That is a lie. We need to be patient with ourselves. And even when we say, Lord, okay, I hear you. Okay, patience is a fruit of the spirit. Okay, I believe it, I'm there. I need to do a better job fertilizing that particular quality, I admit it. And so, Lord, I choose to work with you. Give me opportunities to be patient. And patience with ourselves means that when we blow it, when our child calls and asks a question we were afraid they'd ask and we blow up abruptly and hang up the phone, patience with self means we forgive ourselves as readily as we hope we forgive others. We pick up the phone, we apologize, we make amends, and we move on. Patience, patience. A big part of being patient with ourselves is something that our culture fights against tooth and nail. And that is even for those who are retired, small r here in Florida, <laughs> even for those who are retired, we have this way of putting too many things on the calendar for any one day. And the best advice most of us can get is widen your margins. 
Remember Literature 101, creative writing. If you handed in an essay that was supposed to be one page and you thought you'd be cute and do it in 10 font with five uh, half an inch margins, how the teacher would put a big red F on that and say, try again. We may need that in life. We crowd too much. Our culture says that's good living. Our God says, where's there room for me? Where's there room for patience, for love, for joy, for peace, for gratitude? One newlywed discovered that she would need to work on patience for the rest of her life with her new husband. <laughs> she knew it before they said, I do. It became more real afterward. And so she found a brilliant way to pull herself back and help her patience grow. She wrote out a little poem. She cut it out and put it on a part of the bathroom mirror that only she would see. And she sent a copy to her mom. And her mom went and made it more public. Here's what it was. Her, this is Jennifer's prayer. I pray for wisdom to understand my man. I pray for love to forgive him. I pray for patience for his moods. Because, Lord, if I pray for strength, I'll beat him to death. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> One last word from the Apostle Paul. First, Second Thessalonians 3, 5. I pray that the Lord will guide you to be as loving as God and as patient as Christ. Whew. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, that is our prayer. And so may it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I trust you will all follow me down to Fellowship Hall for the party to begin. But now let us prepare to go out in the world bold and unafraid, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are with us now and will remain always. Amen.